clock. Um, here we are. This is going to be my last lecture today. So that'll be that'll be it for Unit 7. Uh, you only be in at the end of the uh, lecture. We can have a chat with Yoni. Um, note that tomorrow we've got this great lecture by Anna Ferglin. Um, highly recommend that one. It's really interesting. Uh, she has a lot of history with simulation and things in her past, but you can you can check it out. Um, and following on from that next week, Yoni will finish off the course with an introduction to machine learning, which is heaps of fun. Um, yeah. Uh, and obviously we have our project too uh, this week, but no one's thinking about that, right? It's, it's a bit of an, a non-issue, I think, at this point. But <laughs> Okay. Um, we began to talk about um, data last week. I just sort of spoke a little bit about databases, where you, places you keep your data safe, relations. Uh, just to remind you, a relation is a set of things. The things in the set are tuples, um, and they relate things together. So in mathematics, you can have functions, which is like a mapping from x to y, for example. Um, but if you have a relation like x equals y squared, um, there might be multiple y's that satisfy that for a given x. Um, so it's not functional the other way around, but it's still a relation, sort of a generalization of functions. Um, and when we have um, actual relational data, you might have um, different, uh, like you can normally just visualize this as a table because every tuple has the same number of elements. Generally, each column has a fixed type uh, and a name, um, and you might have a number of rows. And like I said, it's a set. So in, typically, in typical relational databases, um, they'll they'll probably be unique. The entire row will be unique. Um, but it can be that it's just like it's like an array. It could be just a, an arbitrary bag of different numbers of things that might not be unique. But generally, uniqueness is a big part of um, relational databases. Um, so here you, you might also think when you have some sort of uniqueness, um, that, that can also make that a functional relationship. So you might go from name to birth date, for example, that could be a functional relationship. Also here, literally this, this thing is adult is a mathematical function of birth date. If you're 18 years old, you're an adult. If you're not, you, yes. Oh, it's, it's ah, that is fascinating. We can't see what's on my screen because it's so laggy or something. Let's have a look. So nothing's happening. Um, thank you for... Why would it be doing that? Sorry for the technical issues. Um, I'll just click stop share. And share desktop one. Okay. Okay. All right. So here I was blindly talking through the lecture notes without you. Um, so these are the relations we're talking about. And there's this table here. Um, and you can imagine a mapping, you know, maybe maybe the each row is uniquely identified by the name of the person. Um, or perhaps not, maybe you, you need something else to disambiguate if people have the same name. Um, and that could be a functional relationship from the primary key of this table. Um, and uh, there might be another functional relationship here. For example, is adult is a function of birth date. Okay. So, um, you know, there's a lot of rich structure to relations. And and more, more than that, you don't normally just have one relation. You'd have a set of relationships that all relate to one another. And this can be extremely powerful. So if you remember, uh, I was talking about databases last time. The database is a place to keep your data safe. But part of keeping it safe isn't just like it doesn't get lost or deleted or something by accident. Um, it's also keeping it everything in sync and consistent and with each other. So you don't have any inconsistencies. So one thing that 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 is big in this relational algebra is using um, is this philosophy that every fact should only be stored once in the database. And if something about that fact or that piece of information has changed, you change it in that one little place, and the whole um, 
system as a whole realizes that it, it's not like it's not doesn't really exist in multiple places so that you have to remember to update it in two or three places to get the, the right thing so let's just have a little example um i'm, I'm just got this example from this uh, excellent book here um about linkedin It'd be similar for facebook or something um we've got this linkedin profile for bill gates um and you can in the linkedin page you, you can sort of see this kind of information when you see someone's view. Obviously, it's styled differently, but here, here's Bill Gates. Here's, here's uh, some of his experiences and education and that. But how is that data stored inside LinkedIn? So it would be stored in some way like this. You'd have like a table of users. Now, there could be multiple people called Bill Gates, right? So we'd have this user ID column. Um, and that, let's just do something interesting here. If, if maybe when Bill joined LinkedIn, First, he put down William Gates and decided to change that to Bill later. He would only have to change that here. And then all the, the web pages and that, which depend on this database, will query it from here, and, and that would automatically change his name. Okay. Um, but the other thing um, is you can see all these arrows, all these links. So you have all these identities, and they, they are linked to different tables. So, for example, the regions, this is where he says he's from the greater Seattle region here. He's from region US 91. Um, which is Greater Seattle Region. And again, you could imagine sometime in the past that might have just been called Seattle and they updated that name to Greater Seattle Region or something like that. And when you update that, you don't have to go find all the people that lived in Seattle and find them and update their region to Greater Seattle Region. You just change that one tiny little string inside the database and maybe a million people's profiles changed, okay? Um, so you can see all these links to the different industries is in. Some of these links aren't unique, like maybe someone lives in one region at a time. Um, but uh, a, a user may have multiple positions at once or in the past. Um, and so, so, so the user ID column might link here, and that might not be unique. There might be multiple entries in that table there. OK. Um, Uh, and then you can see similarly with the education and contact and stuff. So, uh, you know, there would be a table, for example, for the University of Queensland, uh, sorry, a row in, in the education sort of table for University of Queensland um, that some of you might have on your LinkedIn profile links to that. Okay. Um, all right. So let's look at SQL. So, so I think I mentioned SQL as this, this language. Uh, it's, it's a programming language invented for sort of normal business users back in the um, 70s, I suppose. Um, called It's originally called SQL. Now it's just abbreviated SQL, uh, but you can still pronounce it as SQL. Okay. So it's a declarative programming language. It doesn't, it's not really imperative. It's not about creating variables or modifying them and then printing things to the screen. It's about telling the database what to do. And the database will go around and figure out how to do that, which things it needs to read and write and change and stuff. It'll just do it for you. So for, um, the language was designed to read a bit like English, like select user ID, first name, last name from users, right? It's almost like a sentence. Um, and you can add things like where clauses, which which will filter down the data. So if we if we perform this first query, that'd be fine. But if we performed it on LinkedIn, you would get like, 1 billion rows back, right? And so there's no way that's going to come across the internet or, you know, fit in your hard drive or something. Um, so it's actually kind of interesting in, in SQL databases is, is that um, a query like that could actually, in, in, worst, in the worst case, could bring down a production system, right? Because that database would be busy serving that query. So generally what you do is you'll pinpoint the data you want and a database is very good at getting exactly one row finding it and bringing it back to you, all right? You can do that in a millisecond or, or 10 milliseconds. Um, and yeah, uh, like I said, we had all these relationships between these different tables and you use this joining notation. So a join is when you take two, two tables and put them together. So it's actually a part of the relational algebra. So remember an algebra in mathematics is, is a set of things. So in this case, it's relations. So you might have, like in an abstract sense, you know, 
you'd have relations of all different sort of sizes um, with different numbers of columns and names of columns and things. And you can join them together and they'll produce new relations. And it's just a way of, of, of sort of an inner join is where you kind of like say, oh, where that column here is the same content as some other column somewhere else. And that's what an inner join represents. Okay. Um, and so if generally all these web apps like LinkedIn, they're going to be doing all these joins, bring all the data together um, to, to, serve, to serve that little page for you. And that's what it'll do. Um, and whenever you have any kind of data and whatever you do, you're going to have to join it together. Okay, it's very common. Um, and, uh, but again, this has got the problem that this would sort of query the entire table and also join it with another table. It'd be very time consuming. So you would generally pinpoint a particular piece of data. Now, we, one reason we call this a declarative programming language is the database will go away. It won't, for example, like scan the entire um, positions table. It will it will figure out a query plan such that it doesn't have to do much work. It'll first find the user, and then find that position ID or whatever, or you know, and then and then you and then you know just find the positions just for that user in that positions table. And so it may it may only have to look up three rows on this database of you know tens of billions of rows, um, in different tables, and get those three rows, join them together, return the result. Um, yeah. Now we won't be using SQL in this course. So SQL is really great, um, really popular in in software engineering. It's used for these transactional databases where you where you want to read a piece of data, display in a web form, someone edits something, and then you write back and you edit one little field of the table, one little row. Okay, it's good at doing these little tiny transactions, and lots of them in parallel. Okay, what we want to do as mathematicians is a little bit different. We probably want to look at bulk statistics of a data set. What's the mean and standard deviation of an entire column? Okay. And so we're going to look um, at tools that can take data that generally a form that comes out of a relational database, right? And put it in your computer and, and operate on it really fast. And that, that's the purpose of, of today's lectures. Um, so there's this sort of um, idea or the, this kind of structure called a data frame that we do this in. It's, it's a table type. Um, it has two hugely popular implementations in a language called R, which is just built for statistics and maths, which is kind of a nice language. And then Python's Pandas package has a data frame, is, is all about these data frames, okay? Um, and there's there's data frames in other languages, and we're going to look at data frames in Julia. Um, but th these tools are very ubiquitous for, for data science, for mathematicians doing data work on computers, okay? Um, so... We're going to um, get some, uh, uh, so um, probably worth mentioning, um, another way of doing your work is obviously just in something like Excel, right? And that's perfectly fine if it works. It's very interactive and user-friendly, but if you want to do something with lots of data, um, like we're going to get this um, Olympics athletes um, data from Kaggle. So Kaggle's a platform. Um, that lets you um, to, it's sort of a platform that hosts competitions for doing data science, but probably um, at your level, it's probably a more interesting place to go and, and practice doing machine learning problems and things like this. Um, and it has this, this, this um, data, we're going to look at this data about athletes in the um, Olympics, uh, from the first Olympics. So um, the CSV contains 40 megabytes of data, and lots of rows, I think it's 270,000 rows. I think I, I think I said that wrong. Um, and for a modern computer, that's small data. It fits in your memory, it's all fine. Uh, but for computers, say, in the 80s, I, you know, my first computer had 40 megabytes of hard drive space, so I wouldn't have been able to fit DOS 5.0 and some data program and this file on that computer, right? It wouldn't have been possible. My computer before that used an audio cassette to... Um, to, to, to store data. So um, the so you know as you go through your careers, you know, you, you'll probably be dealing with, with data sets much bigger than 40 megabytes. Um, but for, for the purposes of this course, this will be pretty interactive. Okay. So we're going to look at some different packages um, in Julia um, and how to work with this data. Uh, 
and but just keep in mind you can you can use the same tools the same philosophies in in python or r or, or any other like programming language like even rust has has a package these days so um all right so if we open some file i'm just going to copy this um might be a bit easier if i show you in the REPL. if i open some file uh i just typed a z in front because I fumbled it. Okay, so what are we looking at here? So we still can't quite see that, can we? Um, it's a file with lots of different uh, lines on it. Um, and I've just got it to open the file. And then there's this do syntax. If you remember the do syntax, it creates a function which gets used by open. So it's going to look at the IO is going to be a stream which contains the data inside the file. And we're going to read lines from that data stream and print them, but we're only going to do that five times, okay? So this CSV file has 20, 270,000 rows or something. Um, but the first row is a header. It contains all the names of the columns separated by commas, and the other rows have all the data in it um, separated by columns. So like, like, sorry, it's probably not clear. That's a row here. Um, and then there's this thing NA. That means the data is kind of missing, all right? So that's that's our CSV file data. Um, and that's a very common format. Excel can load it. You can get um, SQL databases to export to CSV, and then you can load it in, in into data frames and things like this. So let, let's look. Julie has a CSV package, which will help decode the CSV, which we'll do here. I'll just copy, copy that. Um, uh, because the font's so big, we can't really tell what's going on here. But it's it's basically a, a list of all these rows, and it's decoded the ID was one, the name was AJ Chang, blah, blah, blah. Um, and we can create this data frame from it um, like that. And now it looks more like a table. Okay, So that first CSV thing, that was just a very lazy decoding of that file. It lets you iterate through and get all the fields out. This one now, is, it's all in memory and it's all, it knows how many rows there are, they know the names, the types, and it, it's stuck it all in here, okay? Um, and that looks like a table, right? And you can, you, can, you can do things like we can look at the size of the data by looking at the size of the DF data frame. Um, and we can look at the names of the columns and things like that. So we can, we can kind of have a look at it. Um, so I'll just, just, we'll just start looking at this data. So it is, it is um, 271,000 rows. So that can be a bit overwhelming. So you might want to do things like look at the first 10 rows and we can start to see this sort of interactively. Um, and we could look for the last 10 rows, for example, um, and we get um, the bottom of the table. And, and this might just get us a bit of a feeling for what's inside of it um, and so on. Uh, the data frame itself, it behaves a little bit like a matrix, right? So a table is a two-dimensional thing. Um, each element of the table is a cell. If you look across horizontally, they're rows. If you look down vertically, they're columns. Um, and the one thing that makes it different to a matrix in Julia, a matrix has homogeneous data in it, like everything's float 64. Whereas for here, each column is homogeneous, but across the rows, it's heterogeneous. It's I think the data types can differ. Okay, so the data frames a slightly different data structure to like the matrix built into Julia to accommodate this and, and to be fast with data like that. So you can still index that like you can matrices with the with, uh, indexing with two kind of things. Um, and you can, you can go further, you can go like, I want the ID column or something like that out of it. Okay. Cool. So if I do look at the ID column, like I've got here, well, what's something you can notice about this column? Does anyone notice something about this data? So this is the first row of the table. Yes. There's duplicates in this, okay? So let's look at five, 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 five. So who, what's happening with number five? So this number five is is Christine, and Christine has multiple entries. So this, this table represents um, events. So it's called the athlete events table. Um, it represents uh, Olympic events that an athlete turned up to and competed in. Okay, so Kath, Christine here um, 
participated in at more than one event, probably at more than one Olympics. Okay. And, and here it can record whether they got gold or silver or bronze and things like that. Um, and we've got other data about Christine. We, we know her age at the event. They measured her height, her weight, but, you know, some people's height and weight are missing. Um, yeah. So if we, if we do look at, say, the height, you can sort of see these missing things. So uh, we haven't covered missing in Julia, so I'll just do that now. Um, in Julia, we have this type nothing, and type of nothing was capital nothing. And it was this struct with no fields in it and takes zero bytes to represent. Uh, but you can't do anything with nothing. It, it, it doesn't do anything. Missing is, is exactly like nothing in terms of its definition. It's a struct with no um, fields in it. Um, and it has a type, a special type. Oops, can't, I can't type. Um, and it represents a, a kind of state of knowledge about the data. It represents data that you don't know what's in that cell. So, for example, when we talked about um, the, the uh, height, you know, this could be any number. It could be 150 centimeters. It could be 185 centimeters. We don't know what it is, right? Um, so if we want to do, say, algebra with it, if we want to go like one plus missing, what do you think the result of that should be? So the result of that is missing, okay? So if we don't know a number and we add one to it, we still don't know the number, right? So that's what missing is used. If I, if I tried to use the inbuilt nothing in, in, in that, it would just be like error. There's, there's no method matching. Blah, blah, blah. So, so missing missings really represents this idea of, of the data that's just not doesn't exist. Um, and uh, so we we might want to ask questions like how many rows are missing? So sixty thousand out of the two hundred seventy thousand rows have missing heights. Okay. So this is the kind of thing you would do um, in data exploration. You, you just load some data in memory. And you'd start like just poking at the columns and rows and seeing, looking at what's in it. Okay. Um, another thing we saw we had duplicates. So how many unique IDs are there? Uh, does everyone remember what this thing does? This pipe. So what this thing does is it will will first calculate this thing on the left and then call the count function with that value. Okay. So this is a dot. This is a broadcast operation. Is missing is a function which returns. Um, so the number one isn't missing, but the num but missing is missing. It's just it's just shorthand for equals 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 missing. Okay. Um, somebody's done. So we we first figure that out for each height, and then count how many of those are true. Um, and here we 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 calculate the set of unique IDs, and then just calculate get the length from that. And we have 135,000 rows um, that with uh, unique IDs, sorry, uh, out of about 270,000 rows in total. So we can say on average, an athlete goes to two Olympics, right? Things like that. So that's interesting. Um, we can use the unique function with the data frames. Okay. So if we tell, if we ask the data frame package, to to find the unique um, rows for, for a given column or even a set of columns, it can do that. And it will just like pick, say, maybe the first data for that column, the unique row, or the last, I don't know. Um, and you can kind of get a summary. And now, now we've got a data frame, not of all the events in the Olympics, but of each unique athlete, okay? And we're going to actually start exploring this data a bit more. So that's the interesting um so let's let's just do some simple analysis uh so if we count the number of males there's a hundred thousand males and number of females um there's thirty three thousand females so it's not quite equal now going back in time it's probably less equal than now but we'll, we'll explore this um a little bit later on uh this little thing here Okay, so let's have, let's break this down. What count will do? Um, count will count a bunch of trues or falses and tell you how many trues there were. Okay, um, and it has has two forms. It has a single argument form which will just expect like an array of booleans, 
I just count them. Or as a two argument form where the first thing is a little function you apply to each thing and then you count them. It's a lot like map or filter or something. It's a higher order function. And this equals equals something is shorthand called, it's a curry called currying, uh, which will create a little function that when you call that, we'll compare it with M or F. Okay, so this is just little shorthands. Um, now, that's okay with M and F. We, we could um, imagine doing this a bit more dynamically without knowing what the values in that thing were. Um, there's this package called split apply combine. Um, we're we're, we're going to use a lot of this split apply combine technique, which is which is a generic technique. Um, doesn't this package just copies its name from that? Um, and it has this function, all these grouping functions in there, and different different functions like that. Um, and my favorite one from this is something called group count because it just lets you explore data and see what's inside it and get summaries and stuff. So we we can see that um, here there's so many M's and F's. If we were going to use this other technique up here to figure out um, what country they're from, and also known as team, um, that would be insane because there'd be hundreds of countries, right? A uh, thousand and thirteen. Now, how can there be a thousand and thirteen teams when the world only has two hundred and sixty-one countries? Well, I mean, there's actually been a lot of world wars and things between then. Uh, you can see China uh, has a lot of athletes, um, but there's like China three and things like that. So you have to remember the Olympics, you know, predates the communist revolution and things like that. So there's a lot of interesting details and 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 stuff you can sort of see in here, historical facts. Um, so we can create these team sizes, but now we've got all these dot dot dots in the middle because there's a thousand of them. We can't see it. So we can even like take data like that. Um, and then we can sort that. Right. Ants. And now it'll appear in, in some kind of order. You can kind of see there's a lot of athletes coming from the United States. Um, you know, sort of these sort of, um, Rich white countries were sort of often at the Olympics earlier on. Um, now it's a bit more global. Uh, but yeah. So you know, do little tricks like that, like sorting your data to get to to get access to the important and unimportant details and stuff. You know. So so th this this lecture is just going to be a little bit more interactive, like this, just to show you how you would do data exploration and data analysis and things. Okay. Um, we can group by certain things um, using this group function. So it's not just counts, but we actually get the elements in the group. So we can get for each team, we can get the athlete name. Okay. So here's all the athletes from the different, like from China or in different countries, right? Um, and so that, that United States ones would have had all 9,000 athletes in it. Um, now that's fine. Um, so this is how you can kind of do this with dictionaries and things, but you can also do the same operations with tables. So uh, data frames has this, this function called group by. Okay. Now the reason I showed you this stuff up here with the, with the dictionaries is to, to just give you the concept of grouping has nothing to do with tabular data. You know, grouping is just putting things into dictionaries and, and sort of aggregating them. Um, and what we have here is a group data frame, GDF group data frame, um, where we've grouped by team. So what, what this means is we've taken that original data frame and we've looked at the team column and we've gotten all the rows for a given team and stuck it in one sub data frame and all the rows from another one team, put it in a different sub data team and so on. And then we've collected all these different teams. So this is a, if a data frame is like a collection of rows, say, this group data frame is a collection of collection of rows. It's a collection of sub data frames, right? And I can get this group data frame and you can like index it with, um, now it's interesting because you can, I'll do that, because you can um, group by multiple columns, you actually index it by a name tuple um, and you can get a given team out of it. Or you can go like the first, the first thing. So it, it, it iterates teams. And then inside of that, we can get like the first row, for example, um, from from that one. 
and then you can iterate through that and get the cells. So it's a collection of collections of collections of cells. All right. So that's what a group data frame is. Now that's all fine, all on its own. Um, but we got this split apply combine category. So we've split up this data into different sub tables. Um, now we can apply operations to those sub tables and combine all that data back together. Okay. So what we could do is from this group data frame, um, we want to combine all the groups um, where and we calculate a new column, which is the count of, no, sorry. Take a count, uh, sorry, this syntax is very fascinating. Um, I'll explain that, we'll go into the syntax again a little bit later. Um, this thing is the pair operator. So it, it will, it will, it's not creating a function, it's creating a pair. This thing on the right represents the name of the column that you're creating. So you can see you have the team, which is the key of the group data frames before, um, and then the count. So we've created this count column, and the way we've done that is get this thing called nRow. Now nRow is this built inbuilt thing into data frames, um, which counts the number of rows in a table. Okay. So the one thing you'll find about something like data frames is it has lots of little tricks. It's 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 sort of a harder. It's a package with lots of little things in it. It's like a toolkit for doing lots of little jobs. Um, and so you might never get to the point where you memorize every tiny little functional feature of it, but the more you use it, the more power you can get out of it, okay? So basically, we combine all those data frames by, by counting the number of rows in each thing, putting it in the count column, and we get this, this table here, right? Um, and again, so I'll put this here, we get it there. But we, again, we might want to like sort that by, um, by count. And then, then we should be able to Again, see the more um, the countries with more competitors. All right. Uh, are there any questions so far? So I'm going to talk a little bit now about how these data frames work, kind of internally, um, and then talk about a little bit more, go back to the basics, how to use the data frames package, okay? And then we'll move on to doing some actual data analytics as an example, yeah? Um, so before I mentioned this sort of difference between these, these software engineers building websites, making these relational databases that are designed to do these transactional things, they go and pinpoint a row and they update one field and then they um, you send a response to some client or something. Um, and then we've got this analysis that mathematicians want to do. And, and the fact that you're trying to do slightly different things actually impacts the best way to represent your data on the computer. Okay. So, um, and, and the main distinction to think about here is whether the data is stored one row at a time and then with all the columns in that row and then all the columns in the next row, or whether you store it the other way or, or the columns contiguous like that. Um, so in the data frames package, um, it keeps what the data frame is, is it's a collection of vectors. All right. So each vector has a, has a type, um, and the data frame itself is just a wrapper for, um, have, have I got this? Maybe I, I can do this now. Uh, it's just a wrapper containing containing those vectors and the name names of the columns and things. Okay. Um, the if you want to construct a row of from a data frame, um, so for example, we can get the first row of that data frame. If if we want to uh, construct that, so to print this on the screen. It's actually had to go on through, get this vector and fish out that 180 from that vector and put it there, right? And it's had to do that for every column. So it's a little bit slow for, for, for the data frames package to, to piece together an entire row and, and give you every value of that row. Um, but it's extremely fast. It's just a pointer lookup for it to give you a column. That's extremely fast. And then that's all contiguous data. 
and you, if you want to say find the average, you sum up all the elements. Um, you, your computer is very good at zipping through data that's all contiguous in memory, right? It's very slow for it to fish around in different places for different pieces of data. Um, it, yeah, so if if I were to kind of use the indexing, we get the same kind of idea here, right? And to do that operation, it's had to go and fetch, do indexing on every column. Um, so so let's look at a different way of representing this data. So the easiest way to do that is I'm gonna I'm gonna type this in. And I'll explain what it is. Okay. So we have this CSV data which was this collection of stuff from the file. It's still on disk at that point. And we're calling name tuple on it. So what it's gonna do for each row of that CSV file, it's gonna turn it to name tuple and bring it into RAM. And then it's gonna stick that in an array. So this is using that broadcast operation. Um, and so what we've got is uh, uh, now a vector of name tuples, okay? So this is the first element of that vector there. And that is stored sort of contiguously in memory as a row. Okay. So so in this way, we've really got um, the data stored as an, an array of name tuples, which is row based. So this would be really fast for getting row 15, right? And maybe editing one cell in it um, or, or whatever and joining it with row 62 from another table, right? And that's what transactional databases are good at. They use this row-based format, and that's how it'd be stored on disk and everything. Um, whereas analytical databases will often use a columnar format. Okay. So um, now this is great. So for for this, I haven't had to use like a, a a vector of name tuples. I haven't had to use any packages, right? So if you're just on a bare bones environment with no packages, you can use vectors of name tuples. And Julia has filter. It has map. It has all sorts of operations built into base to help you deal with that data. And if you need some more relational stuff, you can use split apply combine, right? It can do all those relational things. Um, and I'll just show you one more thing. Then again, this is just to show you uh, another way, another package which deals with the data uh, called type tables. Um, so in this package, you, you again have this tabular data and it's like a data frame that's storing it array-wise. Now, this one's a little bit more, it has a slightly different philosophy to data frames in that each row of this table is actually a named tuple, not a, not a data frame row. Um, and so it kind of represents the same data as this one above, but in a different format in memory. Uh, so the only reason for me really to show you all that is that there's this whole ecosystem of, of data tools out there and you can pick the best one. And we'll, we'll focus on data frames here because it's probably the most popular. Um, but uh, yeah. And another thing I should really show you is this thing called query.jl. Um, so this is really cool. So once you have your data, you might, um, you, you might, want different tools for manipulating it. I showed you some things from data frames. I showed you some things from split apply combine. Here's, here's another cool one. So, so query.jl, if I go to the documentation, um, maybe highlights this. No, no, no. Oh, here we go. Here we go. So it uses these macros to build up these sort of queries for you. So um, for example, here, you can sort of see you're using very much um, SQL-like languages from and select and where and things, okay? And, and you can kind of write this out much like you do your SQL. And so, yeah, some people like this. At the end of the day, they all compile down to very similar code and run fast in Julia. Um, okay. Uh, we've actually we're actually a little bit ahead of schedule, so I might just. Um, what I'd like to do actually is take a break. We're going to take our ten minute break a little bit early, um, so we can just go through this as one block, um, which is great. So we'll we'll reconvene at five fifty.
Okay. Okay. Things will get cracking. Um, an another thing I didn't um, highlight just then is, you know, I did speak about different ways of approaching these problems. For the purposes of project three, just feel free to use your favorite way. We're going to present and dive, deep, dive deepest into data frames. So it's going to be the most straightforward option. Um, but, you know, you have freedom to use your creativity there. Um, data frames. So we're just going to double down on data frames and we're going to have a look at how they kind of work, uh, what some of the functions and syntax is. Okay. Um, first thing to note is uh, this cheat sheet. So if you, if you go to my notes and follow this link, or you just type dataframes.jl cheat sheet, um, you'll get something like this up. Okay. So if you're old school, you'd, you'd print this off on like a double-sided piece of paper and keep it with you. Um, in fact, that's probably the easiest way to use it. Uh, and it will, it will tell you all the different functions, like how to use unique, describe, and different things to do, to do different different things, how to do combining, how to do grouping, um, joining, it'll have joining somewhere. I think there's a whole nother piece of, I'm pretty sure there's a whole nother cheat sheet just for joining, but um, yeah, definitely, definitely recommend take, taking a, a look at, at something like this. It'll, it'll remind you how to use this syntax. Now we'll go through the most important functions now, but yeah, just a tip. Um, so wh what is a data frame? Data frame is this collection of vectors all of the same length with names, right? So the way you construct it or the easiest way to construct it is by giving it a list of vectors with names. That's pretty straightforward. Um, so it will throw an error if those vectors don't have the same length, things like that. Um, and it's just sort of subsume these things. It, it sort of knows the types of the columns and, and how many rows there are and stuff, okay? If if I get um, oh, one thing, I don't know if I have showed this. It might be worth just having a look inside what this thing is. So if we go dump DF, it has all this stuff in it. So just just this is a sort of struct. It has this columns, which is an array of vectors, which has the data in it, right? And the rest of this is all about how to look up the things by name. So there's like a hash map and stuff. So you don't need to know how that works. But basically, most of the data is here. And then there's a little bit of metadata about, about the, the names. And you can attach other metadata to the table and stuff, which you can use in algorithms um, if you need to. But that's what it is. Um, and uh, if you want to get one of those columns, it's, it's pretty easy. You can just get it like that, right? Um, it's uh, it's um, a structure that you can mutate. You can you can change it. Um, so this is this is really important. Um, if if you use like this dot notation, um, you can just append new columns to your table. Okay, so it's mutated this data frame. So not only are the vectors inside it mutable, but the columns or also they can change over time. Um, now, if this were something like the, those name tuples I was talking about earlier, those name tuples have a fixed Julia type, right? So data frames are much more dynamic. They're really nice for, for being at the REPL and um, just creating data the way you want it to be. Um, we, we saw a little bit about indexing. It, it's sort of like a matrix. Um, the uh, first index is the row number, the second index is the column name. And if these things are collections, um, you can get like a subset of rows and a subset of columns, right? So that's what we saw before. Like you can, you can tell it to give you all the columns for row one and it will return this thing called data frame row. So again, it might be worth understanding a little bit what data frame row is, okay? So it's not a data frame. Um, but what it is, is it's got the data frame inside of it um, and it's got the row number, okay? So it's just a lazy pointer to, to, to row number one or row number 10 or whatever, okay? And then when it wants to kind of print it, 
it, it goes and fetches all those things after the fact. Um, that's fine. Um, where have we seen? We saw the other way around where we can use the colon on the column on the row number, get all the rows for a certain column. Um, or we could put arbitrary collections in either one and get a table back. Okay. So we get a subset of rows and a subset of columns. That's fine. Um, great. So one thing you might want to do to get a subset is you might want to do that programmatically by filtering the table. Um, yeah, that's not necessary. Um, so there's this filter function, which is built into Julia and works on data frames. Um, if you remember filter, it, the second thing is the collection you're filtering. So if you imagine a data frame is a collection of rows, you're going to filter the rows. Um, and then you, we can create an anonymous function here. So for that row, um, get is odd of row dot a. Okay. So let's type that in. Da, 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 da. What it's done. So if we remember what um, the data frame was to begin with, it had three rows. So we've we've filtered out the even one and, and just left ourselves with one and three. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, so if you think about this programmatically, it's had to construct one of these data frame rows every time it iterates through. And then you fetch A from that thing, in which case it will finally look up that index. That's okay. It's probably a little bit slow because the program has to do all this constructing the data frame rows and looking up the column each time. Um, now, Julia people tend to be a bit obsessed with making code as fast as your computer can run it. Um, so one thing data frames has is special syntax for how to access columns. And the reason for this syntax is it can look up that column in advance and then do the filtering just based on the data in that column where it knows the type of that column and it's all contiguous. Um, and it can, it, it, can, it can just skip straight to step three out of those three steps, basically. So the way it works is you give the name of the column and then you use this syntax to um, sort of map it to uh, into this is odd function. Okay. So technically, this is building something called a pair in Julia. Um, pairs are a part of Julia because that's how dictionaries work. So dictionaries from key value pairs. Um, a lot of other languages call them entries. Uh, right. So we can do this and it will give the same answer as before, but it'll just be a bit faster. That's fine. Um, but we're going to see more of this syntax because it's used also for convenience, not just speed, right? It's a, a nice little sub-language in its own way. Um, now, what is a function like this doing? Okay. So what it's really doing is it's taking the A column, right? So let's get that, df.a. That gives us the A column. For each of those elements, we'll calculate whether it's odd. So let's say we did that. So remember that column is one, two, or three. So um, the one here represents true, the zero represents false. A bit vector is a vector of Booleans where they're all compact in memory. Um, so that's like true, false, true, and that means odd, even, odd, right? That's all that is. And you can index things in Julia. Um, so I can go like A, B, right? And I can index them with an array of like Booleans, and Julia will kind of select out the elements that are true. Okay, so long as the two vectors have the same length, right? You can get the get the true ones back. And so there's this syntax, and you often see this syntax used a hell of a lot in Python pandas, in particular. Um, but you can use it in Julia, um, where you're indexing by vector booleans to get the things you want. And that's probably, I don't know, that might be slightly less typing than that. I'm not sure, but one way or the other might make more sense to you. It doesn't really matter. Um, but that's how that works. So, right. So that, that was the example of how, how you might index that, but you can also index it like this. The true, false, true. Just to, just to hammer that home. All right. There's select and transform functions. Uh, so select works a lot like um, sort of in SQL where you're getting certain columns. So the data frame had three columns. We can just take some subset of the columns. 
this hasn't mutated the data frame. I could, if I wanted to, um, like go like this, and then we'd basically be deleting the FB column from from the data frame. Okay. Uh, so that's fine. Um, and we can use transform to not only select the column, but change the data in it or, or to compute some new data through a transformation. And the key to understanding how transform works is knowing that it behaves on columns as a whole. Okay. So let's have a look at this. Getting the data frame, it's taking the B column as an entire object, right? So it does this once for the column. It's passing that through the mean function, which just takes the average, and then renames it to a column called mean B. So if I run that, let's see what it does. It'll actually create a new column. It'll keep all the old data, create a new column. If if this if this name match something else, it would probably overwrite it. That'd be fine. Um, and for every value here, it's populated the entire column. Okay. Now, if you wanted to do it a bit differently, you can. Um, you you can use this. I think it's called by row. Is it by row? It's by row. Yeah, which is so there's only one element per row. So it's basically like this, right? Identity. Or or we could go like x goes to like sorry, I've got to make a little anonymous column, something like that. Um, and then I could like, you know, that would be like maybe a better way of that would be double B, right? So um this by row thing changes it from this default behavior of using the column as a whole to using it row by row. Okay. Um, and you can extend this syntax. You can get multiple rows as inputs, uh, multiple columns as inputs, and things like that. And that's all fine. And this syntax is all around A being convenient and B creating compiling code that's fast. And it can do that. Um, so here's a little bit more complicated one where we're we're doing a few things uh, to the table, where um, figuring out whether each um, of the A column is odd or even, and we're figuring out like the lower case of C, for example, of that column C here, find the lower case letter. Um, that's fine. So, and then we saw before group by and combine. So we'll go back to that. So let's create this group data frame. Just, it's worth looking at this twice because you're going to be using it. Um, so, what we've got here is a group data frame with two groups. Um, the We've got this A is odd column, true, false, true, right? So there's going to be a group for true with two things in it and a group for false with one thing in it. So here's the false group, right? A equals two, B equals four. So that's that row there, okay? And then this group down here are the other two rows. So not there. Yeah, let's group them together. Okay, so now that that data is separated, you can act on it. You can deal with each group separately, independently, and then perhaps bring it all back together. Okay, so let's have a look at things we can do. Um, so here we're going to do things to it. And I'll explain this in a minute. Once again, we've got this idea that um, when we're using the syntax, this is operating in the column as a whole. So if we look at the B column, all right, it's two, four, six. Here it's four, here it's two and eight, six. And if you add up two and six, you get eight, right? And that's the sum of that column when we combine it. So we, so we took that group and we summed up B and we got four. We took that group and we summed up B and we got eight. We keep the key, which was A is odd. That's the grouping key. And we append these two columns that we did. Join in Julia. So join is an interesting one. So join is actually for, um, it's a string operation. It it takes a collection of strings and puts them together. And, and the reason why, why you'll, in every programming language, you'll see a join function. And the reason is often you want to print lists and things to the screen. And so you can put a separator between them like that. 
and it will, will let you do stuff like that. So it's a really common function in programming. Um, string joins. Um, so, but generally this idea of splitting it apart, applying little operations to each group, and then combining it together into a single data frame, this is the split, apply, combine strategy, okay? So we haven't covered much about joining, inner joins and outer joins and stuff, but the split, apply, combine pattern is your friend. And, and we'll, we'll use it in anger in a minute. Um, but just to be complete, we will talk about inner joins because they're important. So let's just load a couple tables that make a, a set of relations, okay? So we've got some names, ID one, two, three, names, Joe, Jane, and Joe, John, Jane, and Joe. We've got jobs. What, what, what do they do? Um, and if we look at this data, uh, we can we can make some relationships. So the ID represents the person, and we can see that person one is called John Doe, and person one is a lawyer, right? And Jane is a doctor. We don't know what Joe is. We don't have an ID three here. We don't know the name of the farmer. Okay, so th that's an interesting relationship. So we have this inner join function. Um, there's a function of the same name in split of Y combine. That's why I just put that data frame dot there. Um, and what it does is it puts the data together. So it discards all the rows that don't match. That's the inner part. Um, might be a bit unintuitive, but that's what the inner does. And it joins together all the columns. Um, it, it matches on the columns that overlap, um, in this case, on ID. So it's joining on ID. But you can join on multiple columns. That's a very common pattern as well. Okay. And then you might join that with something else and join that with something else, join with something else, and then do split apply combine on the end. Right. And that's a typical hour as a data scientist, you know, or data analyst. Um, Okay, cool. So are there any questions about how to use data frames? Anyone want to um, explore any of these things? Okay. So we're going to do some data analysis on this athlete data that we saw before, okay? So this is, hopefully this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. Um, so we can, for example, find the mean height, right? And, and, but this one's a bit boring. So if you remember the height, um, the height, if you remember, oh, it's capital H. Is that a problem? There were some missing values. So if you don't know one of the values and you try and add them all up, you don't know the answer. And then you try and divide that to get the mean, you still don't know the answer. So the answer is missing. So one thing you might want to do is like figure out, okay, if we skip all the missing things, that's what skip missing does. It take anything that iterates. It'll just skip over the missing bits. Um, what's the mean of that? Or uh, where, for example, sex is male. Um, that mean height's 179 centimeters. If we want to now look at the uh, the female competitors, we can see they they're on average 168 centimeters. So on average, it's like a five and the no, how many centimeter difference? Nine centimeter difference or something between them. Um, so that's not terribly surprising, okay? So, but it's something you can do. Now, we're going to do something a little bit more complex to do with height, okay? So has athlete height changed over time? What do you think? So this is Olympics. It's going back to 1900s. Do you think athlete height in the Olympics has changed or stayed the same? Probably it's probably increased. Why would have it increased? Any ideas? Apparently, generations are getting taller. Does anyone know why people think that might be happening? Yeah, at the back. Nutrition? Yeah, so nutrition is a big part of it. So if you look at the Great Depression, children born in the 30s, um, on average, statistically, were too short compared to their parents and compared to their children, right? Because on average, people got fed not quite enough. Um, and so, again, even as the whole world becomes, um, you know, the poorer parts of the world have become richer, those, you know, those people have been getting taller. Um, uh, me and my brother are both taller than both of my parents um, and things like that. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, I don't think it's a trend that will kind of continue forever. We're not going to be three metres tall in 100 years or something. But we might want to see, 
Has anyone got any other thoughts about um, the Olympics and height and changing over time? Yeah. What's the world population back then? Now, so like more who okay. Yeah. So there's more. The Olympics is probably exposed or, or accessible to a wider population, and so there's probably a bigger group of outliers to sample from. So you know, the ten tallest people from your country who might be the best at basketball or something are probably going to be taller than they were fifty years ago or eighty or hundred years ago. Um. Yeah. That's great. Those are great answers. So uh, we have all this data. We have 270,000 rows. Statistically, we should be able to see this really easily, right? You'd think. So let, let, let's just do that. So we're going to group by uh, gender because we already know. That's right. Yeah. What are we doing? All right, yeah, that's right. So here's the example from earlier. This is just copy and pasting from, from the previous hour lecture, okay? This is just some, um, uh, we create the, the grouping by, say, gender, and um, we, can, we can find the mean height. So, so let's, let's first go through this one and look at what's happening. Um, so this is just repeating this analysis I did here with the, the two means for M and F, right? Just using the grouping stuff. So this is just getting us used to the grouping and then we're gonna apply the grouping over the years, right? So let's have a look. We, we group, we create two, a group data frame with two groups, male and female groups. Um, and we uh, combine that by getting the mean height. And we've got this little thing. Has anyone recognized this symbol? It's the compose symbol. So in, in that, so when you compose to function, you use this little circle. If you want to use that at Julia, you can. Um, you go slash circ. Oh, I don't have the slasher. So in Julia, you can always you do all these completions. It has emojis, it has latex, it has Greek characters, all sorts of things in it. Um, so uh, that's the little circ thing. And so I can go like, um, you know, I can compose sine with, say, a, heart, a sine or something, right? And then for that thing, I can kind of like perform both of those in a row and I sort of get the same answer back, right? Um, so that's the composition. So here we're creating a composed function where we first skip the missing things, remember to read that right to left, um, and then find the mean of what's remaining. And that gives us um the height column uh by default if we didn't have this it would call, call it some weird name so we put that in so it overwrites the name um and so here we can group by gender and we see what we saw before 179 centimeter tall boys and 168 centimeter tall girls um now we're going to do that we're going to group by combine it's exactly the same except i've replaced sex with year okay so we're doing this for every year um, so the Olympics has been going for over 100 years, so there should be lots of samples here. Um, and we're going to plot it. So we're going to plot height by year dot year. So that's the x-axis. Height by year dot height is the y-axis. Um, and we're going to have put some limits in to make it viewable and stuff, and we get this plot. So what do we notice about this plot? It's, it's interesting, right? Uh, it has some jiggles here, but here it starts getting this really high-frequency stuff. It's a bit weird. Um, but more, what about a hypothesis about the people, uh, these poor malnutritioned people from the past? Okay. Um, we can see here that there's not really any thing. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So should we give up? Are we done? Have we answered the question? So we're actually going to keep going. We're going to dig into this. I, I've got more questions than answers here because, because I don't like being wrong. Um, first off, what about these jiggles? Okay, it just doesn't seem right. So there's probably some confounding factors that are screwing up our statistics. So, so something is going on strange with the years and the jiggles. Um, and it, it happened around, what's that, 1990 or something. And, and an interesting event that happened there was the Winter Olympics started getting offset by two years compared to the Summer Olympics. Okay. So, um, in 1994, 
There you go. That would be the first Winter Olympics that got offset. And if we now group by year and season, so I'll do exactly the same analysis except grouping by year and season. If we do that again, we get this plot, okay? And the, all that high frequency stuff's gone. What was happening was it was going Summer Olympics, Winter Olympics, Summer Olympics, Winter Olympics, Summer Olympics, Winter Olympics. And it just so happens that the average competitor in the Winter Olympics is a bit shorter, okay? So that's interesting. Another thing just I want to note here is I did all this by typing in that bracket, uh, that comma, and this, right? So typing less than 10 characters, different to above, we've managed to group by an entire another field. Now, if I was doing this by hand with vectors and dictionaries and, and for loops, I'd probably have to go back to that, write another for loop, change the types of my dictionaries, update my sort of scalar code to be like name topples or something, um, and then run it, okay? And that probably would have taken me like 10 minutes. Here I did the, you can change from one analysis to another in like 10 seconds, right? So this is why people like the data frames packages, Pandas, R, Julia data frames, because they really enable this analysis to happen really quickly, like exploration of ideas. Um, now, I'm still unhappy. All right. You have a look at this. You might argue maybe there's a one or two centimeter trend upwards here. I'm not really sure. Can anyone think of any idea why, why we're seeing it so flat when we're expecting it, people to get taller? Yeah, we Maybe rising participation of women in the Olympics. Okay, that's an excellent hypothesis. I highly recommend this hypothesis. So, um, well, so first off, um, we probably should have talked about why these two lines are a bit different. Um, and it's due to the different types of sports, right? So different types of sports are self-selecting. I mentioned basketball. You know, basketball self-selects for tall people because if you're tall, you probably have an advantage over other people and therefore you probably play more basketball. And, you know, it's, it's all a self-reinforcing loop as well. Um, whereas if you're like a, a jockey, you know, shorter jockeys have a advantage. Um, and it just turns out the games in Winter Olympics where you need to be agile and skiing and, you know, if you fall over, it hurts and stuff. It probably pays better to be smaller. <laughs> um, all right. So the other confounding factor is the participation of women, which is correct. Um, and so if we split now by year, season, and gender, um, we we get uh, four lines. And uh, we'll just talk about what those lines are in a second. But every line here is going up at least five centimeters in trend. Okay. So now we're starting to see that effect that we saw before. Um, it just so happens that as we travel towards the right, there became more participants in the Winter Olympics and more participating women. Okay. And so those two groups were shorter on average than the the group on the left here was mainly male summer Olympics people. Okay. And then as the trends changed, um, those male summer Olympics people did get taller on average, but these other groups, these other cohorts came in. Um, yeah. In the plot, the group, how do I do the group in the plot? Okay, so th this plot here was pretty straightforward. Um, if we look back here, what it's going to give us is the year and the height, uh, but we told the plot to do a group. So this is a keyword argument that plot takes, right? Um, and we can group by season, okay? And season is summer or winter. It's just a string in the data frame. So I can go like, just show you that, like athlete, df dot season, right? Summer, winter, yeah. Um, so that's how we got that one. Here, if you have a look at the syntax, this looks like a Julia tuple, right? And so I told it to group by this tuple here. Okay. So this dot says for every one of these two things, create a tuple. 
So that's just a little bit of shorthand. But yeah, that's that's probably going to be the easiest way to do multi-key grouping in your um, plots. But yeah, so that's kind of cool. So so what's going on here? On average, people before born before the end of World War II were shorter due to nutritional changes. Sports become more elite. We're selecting more outliers. Um, women competitors have become more prevalent, and winter competitors, the Winter Olympics, have become more popular. So um, these things have uh, all happened. We can directly look at, say, number three, the number of women participating in the Summer and Winter Olympics over time. This is the fraction. So it's gone up from 0% all the way to 40 something, low 40s. So we haven't quite closed these gender gaps yet, but you know, uh, that's that's where we're at. Um, excellent. So just 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 um, one one thing I, I really want to note here is that when we created these lecture notes, I just found I wanted some CSV data to show you these things, and uh, it was really interesting to me because I actually, th this series of steps I did here were things I did myself because I was confused by the data. Because <laughs> I was like, I wonder how I might change my data. I was like, no, that's weird. So I actually had to dig into it a bit to actually prove to myself that yes, people were growing in the Olympics. Um, yeah. So that was, that was, that was kind of fun. But if you just, ex so you can discover these things just by exploring the data. So if you're comfortable with these tools, you know, you can, and if you're in, in a business setting or whatever in the future, you know, there's a lot of undis un, unfound, undiscovered insights just waiting for you. So, um, but, you know, a lot of people aren't really trained to sort of do this kind of thing, for example. Um, another really interesting thing is not to just focus on the means, but also the distributions. Um, histograms are probably the go-to tool for visualizing uh, at least 1D distributions. Um, so this is the probability distribution. You know, the, the female populace is shifted to the left or the right. But of course, some females are taller than other males and things. So it's not like a, you know, they do overlap the distributions. Um, one thing that could potentially have been interesting, for example, is if you just if you haven't managed to split into groups and you notice a bimodal distribution, you might think, oh, I wonder what's describing those two groups. And and a big factor of what's actually coming up in machine learning, one bit, one of the largest, most important tasks in machine learning is this kind of like separating things to groups or figuring out, determining which group something belongs to um, using supervised learning or, un or unsupervised learning and things like that. And Yoni, who hasn't walked in just yet, but we'll we'll talk about um, next week how to do supervised learning in Julia. Um, yeah. Um, now, from this data set, we we could we could we could analyze this data a hundred other ways, right? I could think of like, does the team success relate to the GDP of the country, or things like that, because it has the gold medals and stuff in it, right? Um, so could, that would require getting another data set with historical sort of wealth data for the countries and doing joins. Um, and then, you know, again, doing the kind of analysis that we just did here. Um, you know, another thing that I noticed in Sydney Olympics 2000, we Australia won an outsized number of medals compared to normal. Uh, I wonder what will happen in Brisbane 2032. Uh, so, so does the distance between the host and Olympics have a huge effect or not? Um, and moreover, can we predict directly like how many medals each team wins and, you know, that kind of thing. So that's a, that's a task. Again, you could use statistics, you could use machine learning for those kind of tasks. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so these are the kind of tools. I, I just want to just point out Project 3. Well, I think there was a message from Yoni about Project 3 being released. No, under construction. Sorry. That'll be really soon. Um, now, that project covers both Unit 7 and 8, so both this data stuff and machine learning. The idea is the machine learning requires data, right? So part of the project would be getting the data in, and you're going to be using a tool like data frames to sort of manipulate it into form. And then once you have control of that data, you can you know, get get the vectors or whatever out of it and throw them into machine learning algorithms. All right, so that that's kind of 
what your what that project will kind of be shaped like. Um, so both both my lectures and Yoni lectures will the content that content will be assessed there. Um, are there any questions about the data frames or tables or relational algebra while we're here? Okay. So um, I just want to finish with a kind of a footnote for unit seven. Okay. So um, yeah, th th this is this is really interesting. So what we managed to do here was get all this data and load it to RAM and play with it interactively. Um, sometimes you're not so lucky. Sometimes you have gigabytes of data um, and it's incredibly slow. You might need to run it overnight. Um, it might not all fit in RAM easily, so you might have to load and save files and stuff, deal with it in chunks. Um, and it may even be terabytes of data or, or petabytes of data, right? So if you cast your mind back to Dr. Megan Dawson's uh, guest lecture, do you remember she was the first guest lecturer? She dealt with the LIDAR, the, the laser beam scanning the trees and the power lines, okay? So I, I also used to work uh, alongside Megan at Fugra, um, and we would collect petabytes data um, and would have to um, deal with that somehow. So, so in general, in data, um, there's sort of three categories you can think of, small, medium, and large, and they mean specific things. So small data fits in RAM. You can just load it RAM and interactively play with it, or you can maybe make a script or something. Um, medium data is a bit too big for Dan, RAM but it will fit on one computer on your hard disk. So this computer has 32 gigabytes of RAM, but it has a terabyte or, or a thousand gigabytes of hard disk space, all right? So if I had a 500 gigabyte data set, I could put it on my disk and then I could kind of like uh, maybe load and save files and things. So, so this is called out of core processing. So you, you, you do it in a chunk, you, you maybe, maybe those group data frames. Remember the group, the split apply combine? So maybe you do the first step, you, you maybe iterate over a bunch of rows in a CSV file and then split them up to a bunch of small CSV files for each group. And then you might have a second process that goes across each of those ones, makes some summary data, and then a third one, which brings all those summary data together, right? And so there's like three steps in this pipeline and each step consists of a bunch of sort of sub steps. And while that's going, it's gonna be reading and writing disk um, now, this, if this takes a long time and something goes wrong, there's a bug and you, air, and you crash or you, you run out of electricity or something, right? Um, you're going to restart it. And it'd be make much more sense to not start from scratch, but to like start from where you got up to, right? So there's some sort of checkpointing, like saving, saving a game in a computer game or something, right? You can go back to where you were. Um, and um, that, that's really important when you're doing this stuff, because you don't want to waste your time redoing things. Um, and uh, so so you do need a little bit more complexity around A, running all these different pipelines, and B, being a bit more fault tolerant. Um, and a typical SQL database um, that we're talking about, those, those relational databases, they'll work this way. Most of them, things like Postgres, Oracle, um, and so on, you'll, you'll buy or rent some computer with like a hundred terabyte hard drive, um, lots of RAM, lots of CPUs, and it will sit there and respond to requests from the internet, um, for example, or from, from other services to, to read and write, um, um, perform SQL statements just to read and write rows basically. Um, but it can do that. It could have a hundred terabytes of data on disk and it might only take 10 milliseconds to fetch a particular row, right? So these things are very well tuned. Um, and it can do like maybe serve a thousand people concurrently in that millisecond. It might be also dealing with a thousand dollar kind of people making requests. And that's how something like Facebook works and can scale out to so many customers all at the same time. Um, well, Facebook actually deals with big data. So they've had to shard up those databases onto different computers because it wouldn't fit on one hard drive or one computer's set of hard drives. Um, so, so now, we, now we're getting into a, a whole new regime um, that requires a distributed system. So you're going to have, let's say you had two computers. Um, this one could do some work and this one could do some work. But what they do need to do is send a message to one another across a network. And, and messages are really interesting. They're really fraught. A message could go missing or it could be delayed. And so you don't know um, 
this computer doesn't even know whether this computer's finished, right? Because it might have sent the message and never arrived, or or it may have finished 10 milliseconds ago and the message still hasn't arrived over here yet. Okay. And that makes it really hard to coordinate who's doing what, who's responsible for what, what's the source of truth. Uh, what if something goes wrong? Where do we start from again? Okay. So there's a lot of complexity in distributed systems. Um, and they can be so big that even that doing analytics, your calculation, they might not involve two computers. It might involve a hundred computers running for um, running for, I don't know, like um, weeks, right? Um, or, you know, there could be these Fugro style problems where, you, you, where, where you're doing that all year round and you always expect, you know, on average, one of the computers you're renting from Amazon, you know, on average, it will die, like it's RAM or hard drive will die or something uh, a few times a year or, or more often, maybe, maybe a few times a month um, or a few times a day from your calculations. So whatever system you build around that, it needs to be fault tolerant. And you're going to have this calculation in flight. And during this calculation, maybe you expect three of your computers to die. And, and this system has to be self-healing. You know, you have to repair the aircraft while it's flying kind of thing and finish the calculation and give you the right answer. Um, and there's all sorts of tricks to that. So you can kind of see the, the complexity increases rapidly as you get to bigger problems. So if you can do small data, that's certainly a lot easier and better. I highly recommend that. Um, and yeah, that's what we're working at now. But you know, if you if you're in the middle of project two and you're worried your simulations, it takes 15 minutes to get the statistics you want or something. It's like, well, at least you're not spinning up 20 computers and running them for two weeks. You know. So um, you know, as if you if you happen to get more and more into computing, you'll you'll get more and more used to these things. Um, Okay, that's all I want to talk about. Yoni wants to turn up, um, and he said he would come before the end of the lecture, and he said he'd be soon. So I'll write to him. Uh, but he he was he was keen to talk to you about um, project two, so it's probably worth hanging around. Uh, uh, any any questions? Um, or any, anything you want to discuss while we're here? Don't be shy. It'd be better if we weren't bored. Yes. Yeah. It's about project two. Yeah. Yeah, okay, about project two. Let's talk about project two. Um, yeah. Yeah, so after graphing the bed for test four, um, that's the one where we're asked to show if decreasing R will always lead to decreasing average two ways. Yes, I remember that, yes. I'm kind of noticing that the results are very parabolic. Parabolic. Yeah, like because when you lower R, you also lower the arrival rate proportionately. Right, so remember it asks you to... Oh, right, yep, yeah. So... Okay, that's a good good observation. But does it initially increase or decrease when R goes from one to 0.99 or something? Oh, it initially increases. Yes. Yeah, but that's an interesting observation that it, it turns around and goes the other way. Yeah, it's like a high. Yeah, it's just like it's 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 decreasing until 0.5 or something. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't know if it looks like this, but like. Yeah, I'll have to show the people at home. Only to be fair, here's a parabola. <laughs> okay, that's cool. That's cool. So, um, yeah, no, that that's a fair. Uh, well, hang on. It shouldn't. Have... Are you saying people aren't arriving from the outside world if the machine's broken or something, or are they going home? Uh, if you if you if you're fixing yeah. Rose Star or something, yeah. Hi, Yanni. Hey, we're actually done. We're talking about Project Two. Yeah. So uh, here's Yanni. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Should... The third year running, Dr. Annie Ferris. 
actually created a lot of things in Julia, so we have a lot of, um, it was very good to have Andy's know-how and expertise teach the course, uh, teach into the course, help create the course. And uh, so let's just have a round of applause for Andy. And then again, just yes. All right, so you, you ran some questions. Yes. Yeah, why don't we just do we, if we want to include this poem, I'll make sure this microphone's on too. Oh, yeah. There you go. Um, I should say, put, oh, there's a few people now. There's a few people. Okay. If you are home um, and you have some questions, uh, feel free to chime in. Okay. So, so we, we sort of got to the point where I discovered it. if I ask people at Project 2, they grow and they mm -hmm. don't want to talk about it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Do people need another consultation hour this week in addition to Wednesday? No? I, I don't see any strong demand in the... Yeah, that seems to be no. Okay. okay. You're just working. I think they're just working. Okay. Aaron, yeah. Very nice. Was there anything else you wanted to? No, no. It's just to just give support for Project Two because the practicals this week yes. don't want to offer support yeah. for Project Two. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, yeah, I, I Project Two question. Project Two. Uh, yeah. Project Two. I was thinking about. Um, uh, so one of the things you tell us to save in the Jackson network state is like the, the stuck job times, the amount of time the jobs were stuck. And I've seen a lot of people talking Ed, about like how to do breakdowns, because there's a lot of breakdowns. But none of these approaches I can think of need would need that part of the state. Like I, to me, it seems like all of that would be held in the CNET function as like a local variable. I'm just not sure how, how, how you would use that. Oh, okay. So just to, for those that didn't hear, also for the record, are we recording stuff? Yeah. So the so thanks for the question. So the question is about, uh, we, we suggested in the project to maintain within the state. So the actual state of the system as a state is, is, is how much uh, or the duration left for a job. And that's in particular important when the system breaks down. So jobs being served is, is broken down. Uh, and the second part of the question is, hey, a way that I can implement it is actually have that in the priority queue, which is not really part of the state. It's more part of the simulation environment. If that is what you choose to do, that is fine, right? So it's in the state of the system in a general sense, you know, right? So it's just important that pr pragmatically the way we implement breakdowns here is you know, working, 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 break down, pause, and then working, working again. Just, just want to say, we said that in one of the consultation hours, you should know that a different, so this is not the right solution, but it's it's a bit easier. So you can might start with that if you still haven't done it. Just it's, it's a, you can do working, 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 broke down. That means next time we have to restart, right? So that would be different, right? It, it's actually the same for exponential processing times. So from a statistical perspective. So the same, so because an exponential random variable even if it's a, it has a memoryless property for the, those that know what that is, you know it's it's been twenty minutes have passed. How much time is remaining? Well, that that distribution of the remaining time doesn't remember the past. Okay, so that's an easier implementation, right? So that's breakdowns with re, with restart, not breakdowns with resume. Uh, but yeah, then that that's the one bit that's fidgety on on how to implement that properly and probably good to do tests for that on a very simple toy example that you play with. So say yeah. even one queue, one queue, you know, single single queue network and just has a right one person turn up when it breaks and just check it does right. the right thing. And log the events, right? Yeah. Run it with the same seed. Do yeah, printing you could, you could literally turn arrivals off and just put one arrival in initial or something. Yeah. Just see what happens, that kind of thing. Uh, what if we store something slightly different in state that we can use? Like what if so uh the way I was thinking is we simulate all the breakdowns first and then remember that from, from T dot up to T max and then just reverse the pin the what oh. intervals. 
you can from a path perspective yeah, yeah. it's not a constant memory simulator yeah uh, yeah. yeah so um, that's not a requirement is it actually that's not really it's, but it's but, a but you point. can it's not ideal. yeah so but there is yeah. right so so this uh you know your mathematicians that's a mathematical view on things right so you kind of you know you say okay there's what's going to be in the world we're going to simulate what's going to happen with the breakdowns but maybe in a more realistic scenario the chance breakdown depends on how much it's being used so that's all yeah, so there, there could have been a different implementation, right? Where yeah. breakdown is queue dependent, uh, job dependent. Yeah, yeah, it could be. Yeah. Yeah. And as long as you live by, and the nice thing with task four, we're going to, so task three, I hope it's clear to everybody that what you did in task two, you get theoretical curves, right? This kind of row over one minus row, but it's a summation of row over one minus row. Right, so the beautiful theory of queuing networks, blah, 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 so everybody's doing, who's done stat 3004? Okay, so STAT 3004, you learn mathematics for these types of models, okay? But the mathematics actually breaks for task four. It works for exponential crossing times and a few special cases. Yeah, that's, but so if you, so with, when you finish task three, when you go to task four, we're gonna get curves. They they should look the same for the whole class, right? There is a, there is a truth up to- <laughs> There's an answer. <laughs> In an ideal world where we're we're all individuals, yeah. No, so uh, if everybody plagiarizes from student X, no, I'm joking. But they should look the same because there's that truth, right? There's a truth on what the row over one minus row curve looks like. It's not any more row over minus row as a function of square coefficient variation and breakdowns. So you, I don't think there's a problem of also sharing output if you want in ed, right? Not not code, but output. So, you know, that's that's the output. That's your view of. Feel free to do that. Yeah, yeah you can check if you're on the right track. Yeah, it's certainly monotonic, etc. And certainly the quote physics of queuing theory says that when you have more when CS square coefficient variation is higher, those curves are going to move up. You've got more variability. If there's very little variability, there's less queuing phenomena. These are all stable queues. One question about the processing time again. I interpreted it in a bit of a different way. So rather than storing the amount of time left on it, I stored when the original, like when we think that this thing is going to finish. Um, is it fine to like store something different to what's like I guess specified in that comment? As long as it's like yeah, that state's retrievable. Yeah, right? I mean, yeah, it's, it's you just subtract from current time, you get the other number, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's like equivalent information. And like we're saying, that's storing state. In some sense, it's preferable to keep state in that state variable because it's explicit and findable and debuggable. But it's again, state just means it lives in the memory of the simulation, right? Um, it could be in some uh, closure, some function, implicit parameters inside some closure and inside some function, which is getting yeah. passed to some process or something, um, to some event. Um, but that's implicit and harder to view, I suppose. But other than that, it's, it's equivalent, though, it's still information, right? And then just another one getting like that right answer, I guess, just ask you all. Um, since it, like, CS, so the way that I've been looking at it is that it kind of changes the volatility of the system and it's going up. Um, and so if we want to see that increasing CS will, like, almost uniformly increase Q, like, should we be like sampling CS? Like, could we pick that sample as an average? Because I've noticed in some of my runs, sometimes if you just pick one city, you'll happen to get like CS2 gives you a better number. Oh, wait. So, so yeah. CS is a system parameter, right? Yeah. It's not a, no, you, you do have the empirical CS, right? You, you can do that, but very quickly it's going to be according to that. CS. So you're generating processing times. Yeah. Okay. You're generating processing times for different queues. You can, as a debug, if you'd like, as you generate processing times, collect those times, take their uh, variance. Divide that by the mean squared, take square root all of that. That'll be the empirical CS. That should be the CS that you asked it to yeah. have. Not a, but it's not a likely bug to have the wrong CS. I mean, maybe, maybe it is on the well, finish. I, I think it was more the because the random seed, it's not just a random seed, like the dynamics change, right? Even with the same seed. So I think he was saying sometimes it increased CS level and it comes out with just from noise. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but don't yeah. worry about the noise. No, it's meant to be noisy, right? If you have too much noise, simulate for longer, do 
100 trajectories and average them either way. Yeah. Yeah, and if but if you also keep the same seed, then you actually change CS as you keep the same seed. So the same seed for multiple runs. This is called common random numbers. If there's not, it, it depends. This is a complex simulation, so there's a lot of things. Yeah. Depends how many random number generators yeah, you have, have but but you do have some is. sort of continuity, yeah. right? So it, this is even if it's, forget the CS option. Just think about that you're simulating expected Q length or estimating expected Q length as a function of row star. So you move row star on a grid, right? From 0 0.01 to 0 0.99, say, right? Or something like that. Don't do it on a grid that you have to wait for the computer for three hours every time you debug. Only to again. So if you if you keep the same seed for each one of those, you're going to get a curve that seems up. more, quote, continuous yeah. than doing a separate random number generator seed for each one. Yeah. That continuity is deceiving because even for small samples you'll see something that looks oh I got a curve but it's way off. That that property is called common random numbers. So it's not so much like the correct answer, it's like it's just like the kind of like non-noisy graph. It's just like you're gonna have noise, noise right? Yeah. If there's noise that you might get it might not be monotonic, for example. Man, just a bit loud. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So, I mean, we've got a, a system that's parameterized, you could say, by what three things CS, R, and row star, right? So the way we chose to look at it is is always plot things where on the x axis we have row star because that's kind of natural, and then vary CS and R, and then keep CS fixed, change R, keep R fixed, change CS. So we could have done different plots. Yeah. And that's just uh, yeah. Does that help? Okay. So, so Henry, Henry has a question: How do we test if our breakdowns are correct? Uh, so Henry, uh, test three and four are really about that. Um, first, you can look at the trend. Um, if the if, it, if the queue is less available, if the service is less available, um, you expect the queue times to increase, uh, and that would just be a general fact. Um, but you could also probably quantitatively say by how much, right? Like if it's if it's unavailable one percent of the time, that's somewhat equivalent to it taking one percent longer to serve people on average. Um I don't know if that makes if that works. But, but the thing is row star is adjusted to R. So the way the formulas work for you. Right? Yeah, yeah. And then so, there's the adjustment. So yes. so we actually so so test four is yeah is a is a is a black box test outside. Yeah. Know? But really I think almost everybody I would suggest that you you run on a small example with a small fixed seed to numbers that you actually know them and you do a full trace and you and you just see, you just log. Yeah. And you say, yeah. and you you say, okay, and if you want to make life easier, you can also instead of exponential breakdowns, you just for debugging, you just put like uh, uh, deterministic breakdowns. So you change it. The breakdown is for that purpose, right? So the breakdown is 0 0.8 up, 0 0.2 down, 0 0.8 up, 0 0.2 down, for example. Right. So then, and you you, yep. you look at the system state, and you just go and pen and paper on a yeah. small trace. It's it's a pro and and th because anyway, if it doesn't work, then with that small trace, you'll find your bug. Yeah, and that's where you go back. You you do a system with a single queue, a small number of users. Yeah. Use a lot of print line if you have to. I like actual. Oh, Ash show, Ash show. Um, yeah, Ash show is great. Other thoughts? Okay, hope you're so. Yeah, of course, I mean, the more the better. This is a bit of a special one, but are we on the change scenario where they kill the theater? I mean, like, yeah. I tried um, running it and stuff like that, and when you have to like, generate those grids for the like, 100 views, so. oh. Yeah, if if it's getting larger, like just do less samples of Red Star or whatever. 
right? Yeah. Just uh, keep it sensible. For for your debugging. And then if then if you have to run for a while. Well, how long's a while? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, like running one simulation took me about five minutes. So running the night of, took me of how many simulated time units? Oh, just uh, like the maximum time you spent. That sounds there's some inefficiency of some sort. Yeah, you could look you could look at like using those tools like code type, what call it code warm type. But another idea is um put it on before you go to bed, it'll be done in the morning. Yeah. If you think there's no bugs in it, there's no harm in doing that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but you with, with these types of things, and, and some of you will have this if you do an honors project or a summer project or something like that, or certainly in industry, you 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 know you're running over a grid here, right? Of row star. So if you run over a grid of 0 0.1, so you only have like nine row stars, for example, right? And then you, that's when you do a grid of 0 0.01, you increase your simulation time by tenfold. Similarly, with the running time of simulation, unless something's really wrong, its running time of simulation should be almost at least for up to some threshold uh, linear in, in simulated time. Right, the threshold is if it's very big, and then some sort of memory allocation, blah blah blah. But that's not it's so so you can kind of predict what a long run is and a short run. It requires some some planning. It's kind of I hope you could see it a bit of fun. You've created this tool in task three, then task four you put your scientist hat on, and you need to kind of use this tool wisely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But even if there are no exogenous arrival and node that has alpha i equals zero still might have lambda i greater than zero. Oh, it's a transfer. Yeah, oh. yeah. The whole thing about those traffic equations, they look at a node, they say, how much coming from outside? Alpha i, that's easy. And that's often zero, but also how much coming from internal traffic. And that's those, that linear system equation. So all nodes in these scenarios are gonna have lambda i strictly positive. That means the network is connected, right? There's not like a, if this is dream world, there's not a ride on P line like that nobody can get. <laughs> I mean, it's, like the secret, it's the secret <laughs> ride. Okay, that's uh, more. Thanks for hanging in. We know it's yeah. a demanding course. I hope you're enjoying the bits that you're not enjoying or something. Thanks again to Enjoy Julie. the pain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you. consultation yes. hour is, is uh, oh, and and there is Anna just called and she is sick, so I'll send a message and we'll have her YouTube video from last year. So no Anna in person to me. Ah, that's a shame. But her video. Yeah. 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 So that'll I'll send a message. So but no no physical class tomorrow and no Zoom tomorrow. There's a video also. Good luck. Almost done. That's all.